Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Remember back when everybody was kind of freaked out about uh, cell phones? You know, Bluetooth and cell signals might give you brain cancer. People lost their minds over this health claim. But was it true? Now, we hear things like kale. If you eat kale, you can beat cancer. Wait a minute. I can eat away cancer? That's a health claim. Is it true? People need to detox their digestive systems. So wait a minute, what's a detox? Is there any science behind that? I've been enjoying a series on Wondrium that deals with just this kind of thing. It's called The Skeptic's Guide to Health, Medicine, and the Media. And yes, the media is often culpable in the spreading of misinformation. Wondrium, formerly known as The Great Courses Plus, is actually a wealth of knowledge on a ton of different topics. Whatever interests you, you can learn a new language, you can explore the history of ancient Rome, you can get into physics or philosophy, cosmology, or learning how to do gardening. Wondrium is this wealth of information for the curious mind. It is my new favorite streaming service. And you can enjoy Wondrium as well. Sign up today. Get my special limited time offer, a free month trial of unlimited access. Just go to wondrium.com slash Seth. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Seth for your free month trial. Wondrium dot com slash Seth. My special guest, Dr. Marlene Winnell, is a psychologist and an author. She has a doctorate in human development and family studies. Does a lot of uh, communications training for couples. I'll bet she's got some stories, but I won't even go there for now. She's written a book called Leaving the Fold, a guide for former fundamentalists and others leaving their religion. She talks a lot about uh, trauma recovery in regard to people who are ex-evangelicals. Dr. Winnell, it's great to have you. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. You're a religious trauma coach. Define that for me. What does that mean? Well, I actually call it a religious recovery consultant. I'm not allowed to be a psychologist across state lines in the United States. So we were really concentrating more on coaching, but I call it consulting because we're actually doing more than that. There is a lot of psychoeducation involved. So it's like coaching, but there's the psychoeducation component. Psychoeducation, that's an intimidating word for a lay person like me. What do you mean by psychoeducation? Providing information about indoctrination, it's really important for people to know something about what they've been through, and they have often never thought about it that way or really understood the process. And I think that any kind of healing is facilitated by knowing what you've been through, what you're dealing with. So there's information about that. There's also information about trauma and what we've learned in the field about trauma and recovery the strategies that you can do, you can use for those incidents when you're triggered and experiencing that trauma. There's also information about strategies that we're using, like caring for the inner child, like dealing with the inner critic, which I call the idea monster, what that involves. So periodically, as I'm listening and working with people, I will stop and explain some things, and and that's what we call psychoeducation. I'm not alone in this. This is also very important in other kinds of trauma work where people need some help with knowing how their bodies work and how it interacts with traumatic experiences and, and therefore how to take steps for healing. Dr. Winnell, so I come out of Fundy Christianity, right? Literal Bible, including a literal heaven and hell. I had a pretty um, rough row, right? It was about 18 months of thinking, if I get this wrong, I will cook in the fires of hell forever. I never thought of it in terms of trauma, being traumatized. I'm not, I mean, you don't have to analyze me, but I mean, is that would that qualify as 
religious trauma? How would you categorize that kind of thing? Well, that's actually a very good question. And one thing about trauma, it can be any size. You can have a small event be traumatizing in a smaller way. In other words, it doesn't have to be debilitating later on, but it can still harm you. And the damage done, I've just called all of it religious trauma syndrome because there are some core ideas that are taught to you, especially small children in the fundamentalist kind of framework that are pretty toxic, pretty insidious, and they may not show up as flashbacks or as serious trauma in the, in the classical way, but they can affect you and they can affect you for a lifetime. One of which is that you're basically bad. The other is that you're basically not safe. You're not safe in the afterlife. You're not safe in this dangerous world. Other people are dangerous and you yourself can be dangerous if you think for yourself. And you can't trust your own mind. So I have actually come to the conclusion that fundamentalist religions, not just Christianity, but others as well, teach these two basic fundamental ideas that are toxic. One is you're not okay, and the other is you're not safe. And those can linger way beyond the time that you reject intellectually your religion but they can still affect you in some pretty important ways. So I would say that qualifies as trauma. I'll beg for the forgiveness of my audience because I bring this up. I've done so at least three or four times in the last few months. I'm going to do it again. Do you see fundy Christianity, maybe all the fundamentalist religions that have uh, you know, a paradise and a pain, you know, an eternal reward or punishment, do you see these as kind of a domestic abuse model? And the reason I ask is that we've got Yahweh, right? And he commands uh-huh. love, compulsory love. Then he says, you know, you get your worth from me. Uh, you, mm-hmm. you are worthy because of me. Do what I say. I make all the big decisions. And whatever you do, don't ever leave me or I'll hurt you or you will be harmed. That just sounds like domestic abuse to me. And it's, it's not a popular analogy for those who consider Christianity a love religion. Have you explored this in your own work, Dr. Winnell? Very definitely. And I call it a cycle of abuse. And you can see it pretty apparently. If you're a serious Christian, you'll go through this cycle where you're on fire, as they say, you know, you're very zealous about the religion, you feel close to God. And then because you can't be perfect, you can't live up to the expectations, you'll end up doing things that you then consider sin. And then you feel bad, and you're not on this high anymore. And pretty soon you have to come back to God and and do something like a rededication, where you're you're crying and and you're sorry for your sins, and you go through this forgiveness. And again, you have this endorphin rush where you think that God still loves you. He's stamped you with approval again. And it's all your fault, of course. Uh, Anything that's happened is all your fault, but you've been forgiven. And so now you're back in his good graces. So things go well for a while again until the same thing happens. You're not perfect. You're convicted of sin and you come back again. And every time you're the one who is at fault, and you're the one that's so grateful that he accepts you back. And that is absolutely just like a domestic violence cycle. Interesting, too. They tell you you're sick, and then they sell you the cure. Yeah, and so many things are considered sinful. I'm interested in life as a journey. People journey out of Mm -hmm. religion, but the journey does not stop. Can you speak Mm -hmm. to that? Have you seen people who, I mean, it's not like... There's an exclamation point when you leave a religion, when you realize you Mm -hmm. don't buy it, when you are an ex-evangelical, but your journey kind of continues. I know that you use the word journey a lot in your work. Can you speak to that, Dr. Winnell? Yeah, I, I think we're all on a human journey for a lifetime, you know, learning and growing, hopefully. And after you leave a religion, there is a lot to learn about being a secular person and There is still a lot to learn about what you've been through in order to really process it, whether it's the indoctrination or whether it's just information about the church, you know, church history and and so forth. How did the Bible come about? And then also understand that leaving a fundamentalist religion and becoming a secular person is a huge, huge transition. It's not like some other simple change where you're moving house or graduating college or 
getting married. I mean, there are a lot of transitions that are stressful and big, but this is big in the sense that your whole view of life, your whole foundation for living is upended. You have to reconstruct what is valuable to you, you rethink your values, rethink what the future holds, rethink what the world is about, how to relate to other people. And you can find that there are some areas of arrested development, basically. There are areas that you weren't allowed to learn very much about, like thinking for yourself. There can be some growth there, like processing your own feelings and respecting your own feelings, like relating to other people, treating them as real people and not just objects of conversion. There's also social skills and sexual development. There can be damage there from all the things that you were told about sex that were dysfunctional. Um, can I jump in here so, very quickly? Uh, I'm interested in whether or not people struggle with giving themselves permission. I kind of know the answer. But I, I, it's funny, when you're raised in a high-control environment, a lot of times we don't feel like we have the authority to make those changes. Yeah, because um, in the religious framework, you're always looking outside yourself for direction. You make decisions based on what you think God's will is instead of looking for your own heart's desire. You're looking for other people as authority, you know, the, the church leaders or asking God in prayer about whether this or that is okay for you to do. You're, you're not developing your own inner resources, your own inner wisdom. So yeah, you're, you're right about that. You have to get to that point where you are the authority in your own life. I've heard you use the word trigger. Mm -hmm. <sighs> you know, it's one of those, it's, it's a term that when you throw it out, it becomes polarizing. All right, people are like it's overused, it's misused. Yeah. Uh, you know, grow a damn skin, people. But I also am very much aware and convinced that there are specific triggers for people to re-experience trauma. How do you navigate mm -hmm. the word trigger from the perspective of a psychologist? Well, if you're using it clinically like what is it and physiologically it's when your body when your your nervous system gets activated because of some sensory input that you've had and your body engages as if something in the past is happening in the present it's possible for your brain to actually get confused about what's past and present because the sensory input can touch on something in your memory and your amygdala goes into action, into fight or flight, and you have responses like your, your sympathetic nervous system gets geared up, which is the part of you that is activated for emergencies, your, the fight or flight response. So you can be breathing harder, you can, your, your heart is pumping, you're getting more cortisol in your system, more adrenaline, and you're acting as if you're in danger. That's technically what it, what it is, physiologically, and that's when you're, you're, you're really going through what somebody else has called an emotional flashback. You're acting as if you're in the past. You're, and so that's why one of the strategies for dealing with it is sensory grounding to help you bring yourself back to the present moment. To reorient yourself situationally or spatially probably in your mind. So what, you have to draw yourself back out of that past experience or the, the re-experiencing of yeah. trauma? Yeah, because what, what your body needs to learn is, to re, is how to relax, how to engage your parasympathetic nervous system, the relaxation response, so that you can utilize it for the things that it's for. Your parasympathetic is for rest and relaxation, for rejuvenating. Your muscles are relaxed. They're rejuvenating, recuperating. It's also how you digest your food. It's also how you get sexual arousal. Um, all these things require the body to be relaxed. So one of the things that you can do when you're being triggered is a relaxation routine because the sympathetic and parasympathetic don't operate at the same time. You can't be completely relaxed and have an emergency response, which, by the way, is not always a bad thing. If you're out in the street and there's a bus coming, you need to be able to move and not be standing there thinking about it, right? Right. Because that fear response is a core human response, and it is necessary in the case of real danger. But if the danger is perceived danger, if it's a perception that something is happening that's actually from your past, then there are ways to self-rescue and bring yourself into the present. The exercise I was referring to is called sensory grounding, 
And what you do is you you go through your senses. You, you notice things that you can see around you. Name to yourself all the things that, like five things that you can see in your environment. Notice that they're real, that this is what's going on at the present moment. And then notice things that you can hear, things that you can feel, things you can taste and smell. And after you've gone through all of that, your body will very naturally relax because you realize that you're okay, that the thing you were afraid of is not happening in the moment. Is that a tug of war between reason and feeling, though? Reason and emotion? I mean, is uh, is that some sort of a logical willing yourself through it? The trauma reaction, the, the, the emergency reaction, is actually not a thinking kind of thing. It's what some people have called an amygdala hijack. You perceive something and you, your body gears up to respond to it because the signal is going straight to your amygdala to energize the, the fear response so that you can protect yourself. And it's actually bypassing the prefrontal cortex where you can actually think rationally. So when you go through one of these routines to relax your body, then it is possible to think rationally. I mean, this is pretty similar to what people have said in the past, you know, traditional thing about count to 10 before you do anything to allow your brain to use its rational capability. And that actually takes a split second longer when you're in an emergency situation. You actually need a little bit more time to be able to do that. Is that like a muscle that you work out? The more you use it, uh, the more effective it is or the stronger it is? Like the more you work through that, the exercise of recentering and refocusing, yeah. it becomes easy over time, right? Yeah, I teach it to people and I tell them to practice it every day, even when there's nothing happening, so that they get good at it. And then when they are stressed, when they are anxious, they can use, this, use it and uh, have it ready. I've got Joshua. Joshua, thanks for calling. You're on with Dr. Marlene Winnell, what do you have for us? Hey, uh, Seth, it's Joshua Bowen. Um, hey, how you doing, brother? Doing well, sir, doing well. And uh, this topic really is special to me because I think one of the things that I struggle with is people online in particular get confused by deconstruction, deconversion. I think they assume that, well, Josh has a PhD and, you know, all these things in the Old Testament and the ancient world, and so he should just be able to, like, reason his way out of these traumatic experiences um, and his religious upbringing. And I still lie awake at night at times wondering if I'm, I've made the wrong decision that I'm going to hell. I mean, this is a very real thing for me, and it's been 11 years. And I'm, I'm actually just curious what your thoughts on that are, and maybe a way that, or maybe some hope that uh, it's been 11 years, but is there going to come a time when I, I, I won't worry about those types of things that I will be able to sort of rationally work through it rather than simply mm-hmm. emotionally. Yes, that's quite possible. I've done it. Lots of people have done it where it used to be a fear and is no longer. Time helps, but also some of the things that I've mentioned already, like studying it, study the history of hell, find out where it really comes from, the, the doctrine itself. It wasn't even a real doctrine until the fifth century and when the church made big use of it. But study the history of it so that you're clear that, intellectually anyway, that it's just a doctrine, it's not anything real. Compare it to the hells from other religions. Every religion has a form of hell. And if you're, I used to joke that if I go to hell, I'm going to have to figure out how to split my time between all these different (laughs) hells. (laughs) Because I don't believe in any of them, so how are they going to divide up my soul that way? But anyway, some of these other techniques that have more to do with your emotions and your body can be very helpful, like going through this relaxation routine when you're feeling that, and then allowing your brain to come online and do some self-talk around whether you truly think it's real or not, and get it more grounded in reality, because these beliefs will haunt you especially if you were taught this as a child. Like, how old were you when you first heard about hell? Yeah, I was uh, I was saved when I was six years old, and it yeah. was because of the, the doctrine of hell. And, and this is, I think this is uh, the difficulty that I have, is that my PhD is in um, Old Testament studies and the ancient Near East, and I went to seminary for this stuff. So my background is very much to know that this is, not rational, right? I understand where the biblical texts come from, but in spite of that, 
the really sinister thing that I have experienced is that the way that the religion is set up, it's set up to answer just those objections. Anybody that steps away from the faith, anybody that reasons their way out of the faith, the theology of of, uh, mainstream Christianity answers that objection. And it is that they've been deluded, right? And they've they've been led astray. And uh, that's what's so sinister to me about it, because in the end, I I, I think, am I just using man's reasoning? Am I just rationalizing this and utilizing man's perspective when really I should be having faith? And that's really the real test. That's what makes it so difficult for me in those moments. Well, that idea that you're deluded because you believe something else is a very convenient idea, isn't it? I mean, it's circular reasoning. We're telling you the truth, and if you don't believe us, then you're deluded. Then, you know, you're the one that's got the problem. It's constantly like that with with fundamentalist religions. If you don't agree with anything at all, then it's your fault, and there's only one way, and they know, and they they can convince small children pretty easily. You know, when you're five or six years old— you're pretty vulnerable. You, you, your brain is undeveloped. You can't really defend yourself in any way. And you get these images that are really strong and get lodged in your memory. The image of burning fire, I mean, that is just so effective. Your, your brain actually remembers images and connects them with feelings more than words. So it's lodged in there. So an important thing to realize when you're going through some of this fear is the attribution part of it. Indoctrination is not the same as truth. So when you're feeling the fear, to tell yourself, I'm afraid because of the indoctrination, not because of the truth, and correct the labeling, because it's very easy to be afraid of something that you've been told a million times as a child, and that is all it is. You've been repeatedly told the same thing. Josh, that's what you get for studying the Old Testament God, too. I mean, he'll just flat mess with you. you know, and just, I'm telling you. I'm just saying. Uh, well, let's I'll, chat about I'll that a little longer. I, I'm so interested much. in that. This is, this is such a great topic, and I'm so glad that I, I stumbled upon the stream. And, and thank you for answering my question. Considering I've been reading from your uh, new book and all that stuff, I should give you a guest shot on the freaking show, you know, Josh. But I think it's relevant to everybody. I'm glad you called in, man. So take care of yourself. Thank you. See you later. That is an interesting tactic. When you come at a six-year-old, right? at the quote-unquote age of accountability, and I know that number is supposed to vary for young children, this is the moment when you are able to take responsibility for accepting Christ, for understanding good versus evil, the Bible story of salvation, etc. And you're essentially charged to take responsibility for your own immortal soul. So if you had died before the age of accountability, it's assumed in fundamental Christianity that you get to go, you get a pass, a free pass to heaven. But once you know the salvation message. Now it's on you. How can a freaking six-year-old process all of these deep concepts? And yeah. beyond that, Dr. Winnell, we're talking about formative years. I receive that information uh-huh. differently at six than I do at 16 or 26, right? How's that work? Well, your brain is completely different. Our cognitive development doesn't finish until our early 20s. And there's more and more research on brain development and, for example, what happens with teenagers and why they act the way they do. (laughs) But for small children, like five, six years old, they are still thinking in, in magical terms. They can believe in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy and all kinds of things. They're they're reasoning. I mean, just talk to them. Their reasoning is a lot more immature. Their logic is different. But the thing about it is, When you get to age five or six, you can understand a few basic things that make you vulnerable. One is you can understand the notion of guilt. Like if you've been coloring on the wall and get punished, you understand that you did something wrong. I mean, a a two-year-old doesn't really get that, but a six-year-old can get that. Also, um, a five, six-year-old can understand a little bit of empathy, understanding that somebody else is in pain. So they can be vulnerable to the story of Jesus suffering on the cross because you're a bad kid. You know, they can feel sorry for Jesus. I remember as a child that age crying because of Jesus' pain. I could understand that, and it was really sad. And then to find out that it was because of me, you can accept that as a child. It's a total exploitation. 
complete exploitation of children because they have enough to go along with the story, but not enough to really think it through and defend themselves. Plus the same people who told them other protective things. Don't talk to strangers, you know, don't get into a car with somebody you don't know. Don't touch the stove, the hot stove. Those are the same people that are telling you that you don't want to go to hell. Right. And most children, I mean, there's a lot of isolation in these in fundamentalist families where kids aren't really, al- they're, they're not allowed to, if you're homeschooled or go to a Christian school, then you're limited in your information. But they also are rarely taught anything about any other religion or humanism or any other way to think. They get told this is the only way. And that's really dangerous to think that there's only one way to think about things. I've got Nick. Nick, thank you so much for waiting, and thanks for calling. Do you have a comment or question for Dr. Marlene Winnell? Hi, Seth. Hi, Dr. Winnell. Thank you so much for taking my call. You bet. Uh, It's been a fascinating show and conversation so far. I'm calling in as a a former evangelical. I grew up in a hyper-Christian household where we started out in a group where we went to the firing range to prepare for the end times. So we were proficient with our weapons to battle in the uh, final battle moving softer and softer into Christianity later as I grew up, but after high school becoming um, an atheist. However, after high school, I also became an alcoholic, and I immediately sought help. I immediately recognized it as a problem. But what was the first place I found? It was Alcoholics Anonymous. And Mm -hmm. their only offer is a spiritual recovery. Their claim is they are the only way. And they are infallible in that. And so if I failed at recovery through AA, it was my fault. And I experienced more trauma through trying to recover in that system than I did as an active alcoholic. I learned prison rules. I took on a ton of guilt and blame. And this might be sounding weak, but I feel they stole years of my life. Um, that, that, That was basically... I forgot I asked a question in there, but no, I think <laughs> I think I, I think I hear your question, and if I can piggyback on on your shoulders just very quickly, I know that religions offer a lot of quote unquote trauma recovery. There's a lot of sort of loaded doctrine in that trauma recovery program. I'll let Doctor Winnell take that wherever she wishes. Well, um, I wish some of the other programs, or the more secular programs, were more well known because there are other approaches to treating substance abuse. And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the question is. Well, I mean, we started, I think, talking about how his experience with Alcoholics Anonymous, which uses a God model, right? You, or a higher power, I think, is what they go for. And, and I, I don't believe they're selective, they're but I, I think it. you're looking for the solution outside yourself, right? You focus on a higher power or an other, and then you lean on that other, which uh, many have argued, I think they've argued it well, that it sort of distracts from personal responsibility or perhaps even human-to-human connections and solutions for addiction recovery. Yeah, well, yes, indeed. In claiming that the disease is a spiritual malady, it's just propagating stuff that's no longer, it's not true. But I felt it as a religion, it felt the same to me just because of that fact that it relied upon an external locus of control for uh-huh. your salvation and they claimed to be infallible, and they had a doctrine. So it very much felt a religion, and I very much felt worse off when I came out than I went in. Yeah, it's actually really interesting to think about, because whenever I look at any kind of a group or program, I look at what are the elements that are making it work, because it does work for some people. And with AA, you can see that the group is effective, and that's true for any kind of support group. And it almost doesn't even matter what you're talking about. And other groups do it too, like Weight Watchers, you know, gather as groups. And obviously church groups are like that, you know, gathering every Sunday to reaffirm what everyone is trying to believe, but also just the social support. So there's that. Also in AA, you have sponsors, somebody that you can talk to at any time. And then the God thing, the higher power, is a very effective adult imaginary friend, right? Right. I mean, that's what you have as a Christian. Uh, You have an adult imaginary friend, and you talk to them, and you don't really notice that you're talking to yourself, but it helps. And then um, later on, if you leave the faith, you know that internal dialogue is really important, and you work with it, and you make it more positive and effective, and you also recognize that you 
have inner resources, which you were taught you did not. You did not have anything within you. You were empty. So changing that belief is really important so that you can turn to yourself. And you can talk to yourself. That's good. But you know what I mean with these these elements that are effective, they kind of get confused with the doctrine of the group itself. And I don't think the doctrine has anything to do with it. I think it's it's these other elements that are making it work. Do we get into kind of a placebo effect conversation? I mean, maybe I'm genuinely inspired and encouraged and feel a sense of support by my imaginary God friend. So if that helps me, does it give validity to the higher power model? Well, I, I don't think so. Not in the end, because I think what people need is to be empowered and to fully respect and recognize their own inner resources and be able to draw on themselves and not, not rely on that. To me, it's kind of, it, it can be a kind of in-between stage but like I said, it's hard to get into groups that are not religious at all. AA is everywhere, and these other programs are hard to find. So sometimes it seems to be okay for the time being to at least have that group that can listen to you and care about you. You know, it's interesting as an ex-evangelical, I do find that we still struggle sometimes with community. I mean, religion does community so well. And so many of the benefits that we get from the human experience come from community. I think that's a certainly a growing right. place for us in the secular community. Nick, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much for giving a, a, a conversation that's quite insightful. I completely agree with you, Seth, that the concept of a higher power is an anxiolytic. It does reduce anxiety. And I completely agree with you, Dr. Winnell, that the social aspects of AA, the fellowship, the getting together, having people with a common experience does actually have a real positive measurable effect. And so thank you for discussing it with me. And thank you so much for taking my call. You bet. Thanks for calling. I want to talk about prayer next. Like, does it really help? I mean, not that we expect an answered prayer, but does the act itself produce some kind of a brain response that might help us through difficult times. Plus more of your calls and more with my special guest, psychologist Dr. Marlene Winnell. We continue next. My connection to the web is almost certainly the single most critical and important part of what I do. You know, the podcasts come from here, my video content, the social media, post about my books and the tour events, connections to the whole community. They happen online. And so I want and need my information, my files, whatever. I just need it protected. And it is, thanks to NordVPN. A VPN is a virtual private network. It's a safe and encrypted tunnel that protects you and your computer. It hides your IP address and it makes it safe. Even public Wi-Fi hotspots become safe with NordVPN. Plus, I never had an easier time setting something up. I think it took me... One minute, boom, I am now safe from being watched, surveilled, tracked, or hacked when I'm on the web. And because I know you're going to love this as much as I do, I've got a great deal for you. Go to nordvpn.com slash Seth or use the code Seth to get 73% off your two-year plan plus four months for free. That's N-O-R-D-V-P-N, nordvpn.com slash Seth or use the code SETH and get 73% off your two-year plan and four months for free. NordVPN.com slash SETH. Continuing a very important conversation about religious trauma and recovery for those who escaped high-control religions and you know, it did some real damage to them. We're going to take more of your phone calls in just a second. First, let me dive into something else that's been on my mind. You know, it's interesting, Dr. Winnell. I was, um, I've been doing some research on my own for another project, and I was getting into the efficacy of prayers. And, huh. you know, many people come together, and I understand the attraction of prayer. You're calling out. You need assurance. There may be a calming meditative effect with prayer. But there was a study that was done with cardiac patients who were prayed for, and some were made aware that they were being prayed for, and some didn't know for sure, and, and mm -hmm. uh, they had all these different people sort of segmented out. And it was interesting because the people who were being prayed for 
the cardiac patients, and they knew about it, actually had more complications statistically. And it's uh, the researchers were wondering if perhaps they felt a sense of pressure, like, oh, you know, I'm being prayed for. I have to get better, like they're relying on me. <laughs> and if uh-huh. I don't get better, maybe I failed in my faith. And that's an yeah. element of prayer, quote unquote, answered prayer that we don't talk about a lot. But have you navigated that? You know what? People talk about prayer like it's always a net positive, but that's not always the case. No, no. Usually, I mean, there are a lot of studies on the efficacy of prayer, and usually they come out 50-50. They don't, it it makes a difference with the uh, treatment group and the control group. They come out about the same. Do you get into meditation? I mean, I'm, I'm not a Buddhist, but there's a lot about sort of that mindfulness thing, centering yourself, the breathing, the calming as a... As someone who gets into, you know, the science of the brain, is there merit to meditation? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all the things that you can learn from that are really valuable. Like I say, I'm not a Buddhist, but there's a lot about the Buddhist religion that I, I kind of dig, mm-hmm. like the non-magical parts. <laughs> you know, yeah. Focusing on yourself and, you know, trying to prioritize your life and don't sweat the small stuff. I and mean, that's probably something. Those are philosophies that exist far outside of Buddhism, but I always sort of come back to them. I've got Kevin. Kevin, thanks for waiting on me. Do you have something for Dr. Winnell today? Well, Seth and Dr. Winnell, first I want to thank the two of you for providing a semblance of community that you spoke to. And sorry for the road noise. I, I actually live on the road full time in a van. Oh, cool. And mm-hmm. uh, I came into being an atheist in the last year and a half. And really, I have just more of a comment about what Seth said about giving yourself permission. In other words, I came to a place, I accidentally stumbled onto a video on YouTube with Christopher Hitchens. And uh, my goodness, <laughs> what a revelation that was. And then, um, you know, I ended up going down that road of giving myself permission to think for myself. And, and Dr. Winnell touched on uh, studying history. And that was also something that really opened me up to new ideas and new ways of thinking. And I just really, I'm, I'm grateful to you guys. And I also was quite intrigued. The last caller, I believe his name was Nick, was is an AA, and so am I. And it's been quite a journey there as well. So I just wanted to thank you. Well, I thank you and safe travels, and you're greatly appreciated. I'll see you next time. All right. Interesting that religions have all these protective mechanisms. You know, you spoke mm-hmm. about the fact that don't trust your own mind. I remember there's a verse in the Bible that says God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. The the Lord works in mysterious ways. It's really a convenient mechanism because they say it makes perfect sense until it doesn't make sense. And then if it doesn't make sense, well, that's just God using the foolish things to confound the wise. And you don't trust your own brain and we have to lean on faith. I mean, it's really a, a brilliant way to insulate yourself from challenged criticism. Emily. Thank you so much for calling. You're on with Dr. Marlene Winnell. What do you have for us today, my friend? I will be starting. I decided to start therapy. I completely came to atheism in 2019. And then with the pandemic, you know, I'm just now being able to get into therapy. And I am quite sure that the therapist that I'll be working with does not specialize in kind of leaving, you know, the higher control environments. And so my question is, how do I build a good therapy goal that will be effective? I've, I've, since I've lost that Christ soldier mentality, you know, everything you do, you do for Christ. I have wanted to work with someone to learn how to build that motivation for goals again. How do you build the motivation or how do you clarify what your goals are? How do you clarify what the goals are with someone who... Mm-hmm. may not have the understanding of what actually goes on with fundamentalism, mm-hmm. how everything is focused on Christ and and that you do everything for that. First of all, you might have to educate your therapist a little bit and make sure that he or she understands what a huge transition this is, because often they don't. They don't get it. They think it's like giving up on Santa Claus, and they want you to just move on. Or it's like an immature view of the world and you're just going to grow out of it. There are some really naive attitudes towards this um, in the therapy world. And, I mean, that's what we're trying to change. We're trying to help people understand, no, this is a complete revolution. You're leaving one world for another. 
So there's a lot going on. How much pain is involved varies, but still it's a huge transition and maybe bigger than all the rest. So make sure your, your therapist understands that. And if they don't, point them to some resources. Most therapists are willing to do a little homework. I mean, they can read my book. They can read the articles on my website that are on RTS, Religious Trauma Syndrome, and, and understand it. A lot of people have done that. And then basically what you're, you're needing to do is reformulate what your life is about, what you want in your, what kind of a person you want to be without the religion, what kind of a life you want, what your values are, and do a lot of that kind of uh, values clarification so that you know what direction you're going in. Some of it might be remedial in the areas that I was just talking about a minute ago, but also addressing those two big issues about feeling like you're a bad person and being afraid of life. Those need to be addressed and uh, working with your therapist around those things, but to educate your therapist about what some of the issues might be. Emily, did I hear in your comment or question that you have been told what your purpose in life is, but now that you are yeah. out of the religious model, you feel like you're standing still looking around going, what is my purpose in life? How do I assign my own sense? Do, do I even get to assign my own purpose and what does that look like? Yes. I, I have kind of come to a spot where now I'm like, okay, I do get to rephrase my own purpose, but I don't have the tools to do that. <laughs> People often yeah. who have been told who they are and what they want, what they're going to commit the rest of their life to, all of a sudden realize, well, okay, if this, if I throw this out, now I'm back at, you know, I'm back at square one. Now what do I do? Yeah, yeah, and having a therapist support you in that process is great. It's also important to get some social support to find new friends that are not Christian, to maybe join a support group. We have one that's been going on for about 15 years, and people can talk to each other about what's, what the issues are and find out they're not alone. It's very important to realize you're not alone and that other people are also doing these same processes and share that. Does your website have resources for, for things like that? Yeah, you can go to mine. It's it's called Journey Free, and it's at journeyfree.org. And you can see about group services and also something we call boot camp. That's a boot, religious recovery boot camp. It takes five months, but it's a long course and taking you through all the steps of recovery and working with about 15 other people at a time. That was uh, journeyfree.org? Uh-huh. I'll link to that in the description box of the show. Emily, thank you so much for, for calling, talking to us today. Thank you. You bet. So I guess that gets us into this isolation and COVID. You've seen people exiting religion, mm -hmm. right, in their own minds. They've navigated their way or they're navigating their way out. But this physical isolation mm -hmm. during a global pandemic that compounds the trauma. And you've seen examples of this. Can you speak to... Uh, leaving a religion in the time of COVID? Well, you know, that's an interesting thing because I have actually had people tell me that not going to church, you know, with people not in person going to church has actually helped them because they weren't getting the weekly indoctrination. It's given them some time and space to think about things and help them break the, the sort of addiction that they've had. That's an church. interesting angle, isn't it? Because we have talked about <laughs> church attendance declining. I think people finally thought, Phew, I got my Sundays back and I can blame the pandemic. And then yeah. they kind of get used to not uh, participating. I know churches are, there's a little bit of a panic among many of the churches because they're seeing tithing has decreased, financial resources, there are more empty seats, and so they're struggling to try to get people back. But you're saying that your experience has been that uh, not only has that disconnect allowed them more time to do what they want to do, but maybe it's it's allowed them to further disconnect from something they thought they couldn't live without. Yeah, yeah. Dr. Winnell, I don't, I don't want for this to sound like an overly dramatic question, but I think it's I think it's relevant. Are there some people who their wounds are too deep to truly fully heal? Well, I don't I don't. As a therapist, I don't believe that there are lost causes, but some of the issues can last a long, long time and be very painful and very difficult. And there are some forms of trauma, like, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses who shun people who leave. It's even more dramatic and more painful because they not only lose their faith, but they lose their families. And that can end up being entirely isolated. 
and scary, very frightening. So they get those messages I was talking about, but then they also lose their support system. And so years later, they can still be hurting from the fact that their own mother wouldn't speak to them when they left the faith. So what I say is it can take a long time. It's not hopeless. And also that even for those of us who have done a lot of work and have healed in a lot of ways, you can still have bumps in the road. You can, or what, or what I call potholes. You know, you're going along and you're thinking everything's fine, and then something happens that reminds you of what you've been through, and it can hurt again. So I think we're always on this journey, even at, uh, until death. You know, we're still growing and learning, and some of the same issues can come up over and over again. And I think that's just kind of inevitable. You mentioned uh, some of the growing pains that remain in the mental health profession. Uh huh. Do you find that within therapy there is a, a religiosity that infects the direction that many of the therapists take with their patients? I mean, if I walk in and I've been traumatized, what are the chances they're going to be like, well, you need God, that's what you need. You know, yeah. you need some Jesus. Does that go on? And That goes on all the time. People in psych, well, it depends on what sort of program you, you're in. But in the, you're not in a, a, a Christian program, but you get told that religion is a cultural thing, that you're respecting diversity. You get told not to question anybody's beliefs because that would be disrespect and instead support them and try to help them use their religion in a positive way. Instead of thinking about an angry God, think about a loving God and things like that. And then also even therapists who claim not to be using their religion in therapy. They'll manage to sneak it in because they are also indoctrinated to think that they need to spread the word all the time. So they're going to try and do that with clients. And that, that's why Daryl Ray started this Secular Therapy Project, was to help people find someone who is not going to do that, especially in certain areas, like in the South. You know, it's kind of hard in some areas to find a therapist who is not religious at all. Like I had a client who was in the hospital. She was in crisis and in the hospital. And the doctor told her that maybe she needed to get right with God. And she ended up calling me in a complete panic because she couldn't handle that. I remember going into, a, just for a, I think I had the flu or something, I went into a, a doctor. He was a believer. I remember after he prescribed all the medications and whatever, he wanted to pray. And I was like medication in one hand and he's like praying for me with the other hand. I just thought to myself, I'm not sure how, how all this works. Okay. You've been very generous with your time. Somebody is watching. Someone is feeling fear. They're feeling insecurity. They're going through all of these types of experiences. What would you say to someone? What resource? Uh, shill for your book which, I'll, again, I'll link in the description box. But, I mean, just what would you say to somebody over coffee who's like, God, I, I don't even know who I am anymore. I'm terrified of getting it wrong. I'm, I'm in pieces. I would say, first of all, there is hope. This is something that a lot of people go through and have been through and that it, can, it gets better. It gets better as you increase in, in your confidence and as you're in your faith in yourself and as you take steps towards healing and growth, and that there are a number of ways of doing that, such as reading or such as getting a therapist or joining a support group, and uh, maybe point them in some of those directions. Does this reflect your own journey? I think you alluded to you came out of a religious belief. Oh, yeah. My parents were missionaries. I grew up in Taiwan, and uh, when I was 16, we moved to Southern California. It was uh, the Jesus movement at the time, and I was totally zealous. I went door to door with other people. I was at the beach where we had baptisms. We were the cool Christians, the, the hippie, you know, with our Christian rock and roll and everything like that and staying in a Christian commune. I was into it big time. And then it, it took me years, I, all through the college years, to break away. Did uh, you go through, I'm guessing, many of the things that you are now counseling other people about? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this whole thing started with me just writing some things down there's a ton of material now, but when I started, there was nothing. So it was a surprise. I did a, a, a short paper at the APA convention in New York, and uh, people were very interested in hearing about it, which was, which was new. I'm, I just have this picture in my mind of you tooling down the street in like an old VW minivan with, like, you know, Jesus painted on the side. 
You got yeah. Larry Norman playing <laughs> on the radio kind of thing, you know, on the eight track. I don't know why I just got that vibe. But uh, uh, you and I have that in common. I think uh, hopefully yeah. our, our stories will provide some encouragement to other people. You know, it can be done. You can extract yourself. You can assign your own sense of purpose. You can go out and be more comfortable in your own skin. And when you get out, life can be really, 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 really good. Life is good for you. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I say to people that, first of all, I say congratulations. And they're surprised to hear that. No, congratulations for getting yourself out. It's a very sticky kind of thing. You know, it's hard to get out. So th- congratulations on that. And the other thing is, I go, welcome to the world. Welcome to the planet. You know, there's there are a ton of other people here, and we're all trying to make the world a better place. We're all enjoying pleasure. We're enjoying each other and relationships and careers. And there's a lot going on. So welcome. That's awesome. Well, one day, I'll drive the minivan up, and we'll, have, we'll commune together as ex-believers okay. and... And you're amazing. I'm so thankful for you and your work, your book, your website, just your your desire to try to help disabuse people of what can be very damaging ideas. You're changing the world, and I'm a huge fan. Dr. Marlene Winnell, thanks so much for being a part of the conversation today. Thank you for all your hard work, too. Keep it up. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.